Hello guys and welcome to Crusader Kings 3. Today, I'm going to tell you the top 10 tips that I wish somebody told me before I started playing this game. So first and foremost, going to new game, is you're going to want to customize your game rules before you start. This innocent little button down here will affect the next, what is it, 600 years of your game time. And oh my god, look how many they are. It's overwhelming, but if you can stomach it, I would look through these and change things to your liking. It'd be hard to know what you like before playing the game, but these options can determine whether or not you're happy. For example, Scandinavian adventurers, if you leave these on frequent, and you make a successful empire anywhere in this region right here, you will be invaded by NPCs that spawn out of thin air on repeat for the entire game up to something like 120 times. It could be very annoying if you don't know how to interact with it. So look at the game rules, try and look some things up if you could stomach it to figure all of this out. That is number one. I've loaded up here's Brittany to proceed with number two and number two is going to be disinherit early and disinherit often. So what that means is if you have multiple children, for example, especially with the way inheritance works in this game, multiple sons, then your nation can end up splitting into little pieces here. Like you could see different heirs that you have and it'll split your lands, your money between all these different sons, for example. And so what you might want to do is go and disinherit the children that you do not want to inherit things so that you could pick your own successor. You will have to deal with some debuffs and some problems just a little bit. It's really not anything too crazy, but the way inheritance works in this game, you're not going to get the actual inheritances that you want that work best with the mechanics of how you could play the game until towards the end game. So for most of the game, and for probably most of your games, since most players don't make it to towards the end of the game in their playthroughs, you're going to be wanting to disinherit early and often. And that's going to be the key to success. And that's something that the AI are not really going to be able to replicate because the AI don't really disinherit. Number three, if you're playing as a Catholic or any religion that has access to communion, and a, for example, theocratic head of faith, as opposed to, you know, not having a head of faith and not having access to communion as a doctrine, make sure that you request gold and not indulgences. Spending gold to get piety at a one-to-one -one ratio, for example, is absolutely ridiculous and not worth it. With ask for gold, it's pretty much always going to cost like 250 piety, but as the game goes on, the ratio of gold you will get improves dramatically. You can get a like 5 to 1 ratio of gold you receive to piety you give in. And then if you just go on pilgrimages to earn the piety back, you can turn that gold into way more piety than you originally had. This causes an like infinite loop where you could become extremely rich, especially as the game goes on and the Pope gets wealthier, extremely wealthy and extremely pious, which is great if you need to rely on holy wars or anything. Tip number four. Set the lifestyle of your children to min-max, their education right here, right stinking here. As a player, you can change your own lifestyle to one of five different lifestyles that come with many buffs and benefits. It even lets you know down here or sometimes up at the top about your own lifestyle. What the game doesn't really teach you though is about your children and how if you select them, this little button right here allows you to change their focus. So for example, I like playing diplomatic characters. So I will generally take any character I think I have the slightest chance of playing and give them a diplomacy focus, regardless of their traits, some of which are not quite as compatible with certain educations. I tend to just pair the education with the lifestyle I will want to play as as that character. For example, this red right here, this character wouldn't work very well with learning. Thankfully, I don't want learning. I want diplomacy. So I could like give him diplomacy as a focus. I would have my next character then because I would play as my kid, for example 
be the kind of lifestyle that I want. The education doesn't have to match, but you get a 30% experience buff to whatever you're educated in. And you get a lot of buffs relevant to that kind of playstyle as well. For example, this guy being Marshall, these are the bonuses he gets, and this can go up to five. Number five, always be scheming. You see these right here? You can always have a scheme going, a personal scheme, a hostile scheme. Regardless of your intent, these are always here and they can likely help you in some way. At the very least, you should be swaying, even if you don't like hostile scheming. Look at this powerful vassal that doesn't like me that much. There's a lot of ways to handle this, but one way that I shouldn't just knock is swaying. Very rarely anything bad can ever come from swaying, and this is just the easiest scheme to do that will always help you. And in some instances, you can have two of these going on at once. So always be scheming. Number six, and this might be a little specific because I am a diplomacy lifestyle player, is very specific to the diplomacy tree, and that is defensive negotiations. Be very, very careful if you take this perk. It is probably, it's in my opinion, the best perk in the entire game because it's the one thing that will allow you to make an alliance without a marriage or some other sort of relation. It is the one thing that actually allows you to engage in foreign diplomacy in this game in the way that it historically worked. However, you can only do one of them and it's very easy to waste this because the moment you get this the game will prompt you with every qualifying alliance that it thinks you might want which it does by default with familial based alliances as well and the way it communicates what criteria has been met for an alliance is very bad and sometimes like i've just seen it take my negotiation perk instead of taking a familial relation it's very easy to waste this as useful as it is so if i were you i would avoid even claiming this until you know who you want this alliance with and then monitor that alliance at all costs. This is very useful, but very easy to waste. So be careful with how you use it. Number seven, and this is a big one. This is a big core thing. When fighting wars over something, you need claims to fight wars. For example, this guy has a claim on the Duchy of Normandy. Be very careful to not declare wars, this is a suggestion, I guess, that overlap with other wars. And there's a huge number of reasons for this. Let's say I go after the Duchy of Normandy and someone else is going after the Duchy of Normandy. If I win the war, that person then gets to say if he wants to fight me over Normandy and continue his war, meaning I can inherit a war. But more importantly, if, say, one of your vassals decides to go to war with the Duchy of Normandy, then your vassals will end up fighting you over anything you have occupied and you will have to fight them over things they have occupied. This creates a war that is not a war, and this can happen even with a foreign participant as well where you could fight their units and they can fight yours, but no war score will ever be accumulated because you're not technically at war, which is usually insanely, exponentially more costly than the actual war you're fighting. Because if you win one big battle in a normal war, you've probably earned 50% war score just like that. However, you could fight 10 massive battles against your own vassals fighting over the same duchy or a foreign participant, for example, and accomplish nothing except wasting your own money, your own men, and your own time. So look at regions before you attack for them. See if anybody else has any participation in them and then try and shock and awe those motherfuckers as quickly as possible because if you do get caught in one of these situations, there's nothing you can do because even if they're your own vassals, you cannot punish them for fighting the deadliest wars in the game against you. And if they're a foreign participant, you cannot use this as war justification to go to war with them. It is a huge design flaw in the game, but it's been here pretty much since release and I doubt it's ever going away. So be very careful about that. Number eight, and this is a, a tough one. 
This is a game that a lot of players get into, not realizing what they're getting into. The inheritance system of this game stops a lot of players from experiencing the game they want to experience. I already taught you about disinheriting, but if you really, really hate inheritance and you don't even want to look at disinheriting, you have one choice on this entire map of a nation that will actually work well for you. Can you tell which one it is? It's the one I'm looking at right now. The good old, not Byzantines, Rome. Eastern Rome right here, motherfucker. These, this is really your only option. This is the only nation in the game that starts with, where is it? Succession law of primogeniture. Even in 867, hundreds of years, hundreds like half a century before any other nation would get access to this. You can have primogeniture, meaning your oldest child will inherit all of your titles. For example, in this case, your oldest male child will inherit everything. So if you do want the simplest nation ruling experience possible, then I hate how they call them the Byzantines. The Eastern Romans are probably your best option. Number nine, and my ability to show this is limited because I don't own any DLCs. There's a DLC activity called Grand Tour. It's advertised as, oh, you can go and make the masses love you, make your population like you, blah, blah, blah. No, it doesn't exist for that. When you host any activity right here, you get options. And one of the options for a Grand Tour is a taxation tour. That is why Grand Tours exist. That is all they exist for. Anybody that tells you anything else is lying. You host a Grand Tour, you host a taxation tour, you go around and you'll be spawning random events where random barons will hand you 300 gold out of nowhere. So host taxation tours regularly, because just like requesting gold from the Pope, it is one of the best money makers in the game. You do both of these things starting in the year 867, and then by the early 900s, you're going to have 100,000 gold, and you're not even going to care about money, and it's just going to keep amassing. You're going to become unstoppable just like that. Number 10, make a habit of having your youngest child inherit. If you are, you know, not retreating to the safety of the Byzantines where inheritance doesn't matter, or whatever, you know, if you can pick any succession law, potentially consider ultimogeniture, where your youngest child inherits, or just disinherit every older kid you get, specifically the ones that can inherit, like males, like initially favor younger children and the reason i suggest this is because due to the mechanics of this game you don't want the oldest most experienced person inheriting because every time you move to a new character you're gonna get an opinion modifier that makes everybody hate you called short reign whereas if you're in charge for a long time there's long reign which is a positive bonus additionally the longer you have a character, the more you can educate that character by going to the academy, for example. That's an activity, might be a DLC. The longer you can make choices as that character, get your stats to where you want them to be, find the perfect heir for that character, etc., etc. If you have two characters that live over the period, you know, that you play as, that live over the period of 150 years, you will get so much more done, especially following these other tips in that 150 years than if you simply played a new character every 10 to 20 years with some sort of primogeniture setup where the oldest child inherits or you know even if you kind of disinherit it to be the older or like a middle child the first time i played crusader kings 3 was actually in a pvp i had no idea what i was doing my kingdoms kept falling apart as bulgaria repeatedly and i didn't do any of this stuff because i didn't know the game doesn't tell you any of this stuff really it doesn't jump out at you but once you do know this stuff and you know by the end of that playthrough and here throughout my second playthrough which i believe is posting right now i know all this stuff and it's very easy to like i said get a hundred thousand gold in the early stages of the game and become literally unstoppable in this game with no big cheesy exploits or anything combined you know you don't have to go to the mongolians 
form the Mongolian Empire and then teleport a doom stack around the map to conquer it. None of that. Just these simple tips that I have listed out for you. I hope they are helpful to you. If you have any tips you want anybody else to know, leave them in the comments below. This video is going in a playlist of guides. If you have any suggestions for further guides I could make, feel free to leave that in the comments below as well. For now though, thank you guys very much for watching. I hope I'll see you on the next one.